Welcome back to Second and Short. It is December 14th, 2022, and this week's podcast is officially sponsored by Brooks. If you're struggling to find that perfect gift this holiday season, check out the Run Happy line of products. From shoes to shirts to shorts, Brooks will help you check all the boxes on your holiday list. Even if you're shopping for yourself, Brooks has something for everyone. Whether you're a walker, runner, gym shark, or just like to look comfortable yet stylish, check out the Brooks website or your local sporting goods store. Brooks, run happy. And like I said last week, I've got the Adrenalines. I got the Ghost 15s. I actually wore the Ghost 15s to work today. They're just super comfortable. And like I said last week, it's all about finding the pair for you. So definitely go check out brooksrunning.com. Get suited up for the holidays. So before we get into everything, I do want to talk about uh, the news that we heard uh, Tuesday morning. Uh, the passing of Mississippi State head coach Mike Leach. Uh, He passed away from complications related to a heart condition, uh, I believe, Monday night. And this is heartbreaking. Mike Leach is kind of like the soul of college football. Um, He definitely had the most fun. He was like the best character. And this is super hard to see. Yeah, this is a... Very tragic news to hear. I'm, I'm very uh, upset uh, at when I heard this. It, um, you know, you, this is something very unexpected. No one would have thought what was coming. I mean, they said he was literally at practice that day. Uh, no, seemed to be just fine, and uh, it all just, you know, it's, you know, everything. You, you know, I see. I always said uh, God had a reason for things and uh, his beliefs. So. But I just think it's very tragic, and I really, really uh, am sending out my hopes and prayers to the Leach family. Yep, and and fortunately, uh, Mike Leach left such a huge imprint on college football and something, some things that will never be forgotten. Um, you know, legendary press conferences and halftime interviews, and just also his journey into being the head coach of an SEC school. Started out, um, played high school football, got hurt, played rugby uh, in college, and then uh, went on to coach at, I believe, like Iowa Wesleyan, and then um, continued to move up from there and, you know, burst onto the scene with Washington State, really, uh, and Texas Tech, but, um, and then moves into Mississippi State. And he's still kind of the only coach that has uh, really, I wouldn't say perfected, but uh, epitomized the air raid offense. So Mike Leach has had a huge impact on the past, present, and future of college football. And his his contributions will never be forgotten. Yeah, and I, um, something I really hope uh, we see in this bowl season is a lot, especially uh, – the SEC teams will uh, hopefully will wear a patch or something in honor of Mike Leach uh, during these bowl games because he did have such a big impact on college football as a whole. Like you said, with the air raid off, uh, being one of the first coaches to be mainly use the air raid offense and showing such a sec- success with that at uh, Texas Tech, Washington State, both, and here um, in Starkville, down in Starkville at Mississippi State. Um, I really hope, especially uh, for teams like Ole Miss, who will be playing his former team, Texas Tech, and uh, you know, just to show, uh, just just to show uh, unity with the team, and yeah, yeah, that that'll be great to see. Um, and once again, thoughts and prayers go out to the Leach family and uh, the Mississippi State football program and anybody close. But uh, we'll move on. Um, We'll get started into uh, today's content, but uh, we'll get started with uh, NFL Week 14. Uh, Thursday Night Football, Rams Raiders kind of turned into a great game out of of nowhere. Like, it was 13-3 going into the half, and it seemed like it was just going to be another one of those Thursday Night Football stinkers that we've gotten used to this season. And then... Halfway through the fourth quarter, Baker Mayfield decided to make it a game. Like, I want to say they scored with like a 
couple of minutes on the clock. I, I think three minutes on the clock. And then, yeah, so they scored the touchdown with three minutes and 19 seconds left. And then they force a three and out by the Oakland. And then Baker Mayfield had one of the greatest touchdown drives I've ever seen. Yeah, I was thoroughly impressed by his, uh, by that last minute comeback drive by him. That, I have to agree, that has to be one of the best dry, touchdown comeback drives I have ever seen in all of my time watching football. He yeah. just completely, they, him and the Rams offense just completely controlled that entire, just everything they wanted went for him almost. Yeah, they started the drive with a minute 45 on the clock, and they were down seven. Or sorry, down six, minute 45, you go incomplete pass, hits the short pass to Tutu Atwell, and then um, throws the interception, but then they throw the pass interference, so LA ends up moving up off the play, and then um, Baker gets sacked for nine yards, and at that point you're thinking, okay, well this drive's over. And then... Unsportsmanlike conduct, 15 yards. And, and the unsportsmanlike conduct was questionable. Um, I believe this is the one where the Raiders player just like hit the ball out of the Rams player's hand. Um, but people are kind of saying like, oh, well, that's soft to call that an unsportsmanlike conduct. But it was more of an unsportsmanlike conduct because he hit the ball out of his hands so that the ref couldn't get it because the clock was still running. Yeah. So I I understand the foul call or the flag, but um, yeah, you, yes, you can complain that it's a soft flag, but it, it needed to happen because he was stopping uh play, but and then just after that play, which kind of kept the drive alive, Baker throws a ball to Ben Skoranek in double coverage, and Skoranek. I don't even know. I've watched it like five times now. I don't know how he caught that ball. I don't know how he came down with it at all. But that got them 32 yards. And then they're on the Vegas 40. He hits another pass to Skoranek. Gets him down to second and one. Spike the ball and stop the clock with 16 seconds left. And then Van Jefferson runs one down the left side. And Baker puts like the perfect pass right into his hands in the end zone. And then they kick the field goal and win the game. Like that whole final drive was insane. Like me talking it out. Does it zero justice? <laughs> you have to go and watch that because it, it's something that you don't see a 98 yard game winning touchdown drive from Baker Mayfield. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know that. Out of everybody in the NFL, I was not expecting Baker Mayfield to be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, like he he loves to surprise people. I think that's like Baker's game because like all we do is sit here and talk about how you know when he was with the Panthers, they were like he sucks, he can't stop throwing picks, blah blah blah. Same thing in Cleveland. Yeah, he won some games, took him to the playoffs once, but. There was never a success story with Baker, and he just loves to prove people wrong to an extent. Obviously, I don't think he'll ever be like a Super Bowl winning quarterback, but he does love to prove the haters wrong. He had to learn that entire playbook in two days. He got signed on Tuesday and played on Thursday. Like, that is a ridiculous turnaround to come in. I think he came in after one drive and then. Lead your team to the win late in the fourth quarter. Yeah, I have to agree. <laughs> Baker Mayfield always, from when I started watching him in college, likes to prove people wrong. And I mean, I think the reason he's able to out in LA, uh, why he was able to get this game winning drive, is they do have some uh, better players than Carolina. Uh, it's kind of something I said last week on him. He is a, he's going to be able to get you a win. When he's got good players around him, but he can't do it alone, obviously. 
uh, he's got to have some great players to rely on. Yeah, and in in LA right now, you're missing Cooper Cup, you're missing Allen Robinson. Like he doesn't have very many weapons. His top three wide receivers were Van Jefferson, Tutu Atwell, and Ben Skoranek. Like those are all guys that are uh, arguably number three wide receivers on most teams. And he was able to get it done. Yeah, I, I, I'm very. Yeah, it's almost like shocking because, yeah, that's like we said already. Just not to be to, uh, be to you know, say the same thing over. But yeah, that that was just so impressive. Yeah, and, and if Baker continues to do this, um, I, I don't see him re-signing with the Rams, but, um. I could see him maybe find himself a spot somewhere that isn't quite looking to pick up a quarterback in the draft. Maybe they won't have a great spot, but they're still looking at quarterback options. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see what kind of stuff Baker can do. But um, let's get into Bills Jets. Um, Bills defeat the Jets twenty to twelve, and this was a solid game all around. Um, Mike White had a, a, a crazy game by how it went. He, I believe he got hurt in the second quarter, uh, hurt his ribs, goes to the back, gets an x-ray. They say he's good. He comes back out in the second half, plays a couple more drives, gets hit again, x-rays his ribs. They say he's good. Comes back out in the fourth. Plays the end of the fourth quarter, is still getting beat up, and then they have a ambulance on standby for when the game was over and took him to the hospital. Like, yeah, what a warrior! Those hits on him, especially the uh, the one the I don't remember which hit in the ribs it was on him, but I mean he just about got broken half. That is the, him being able to come back out and play through that is so impressive because 99% of athletes, if they get hit like he got, he did would not, would not have gotten back up. I mean, hell, if that was Tom Brady. He would be dead. <laughs> like, yeah, just about anybody would have just been like, all right, we can give this one up. So you got to come in to Mike white. Um, he's still fighting for a job there. And at the moment he's got it, but you know, an early injury in the game could could lose you the job. So, um, yeah, big ups to Mike White being a warrior. And then on the other side of the ball, the Bills, they they played all right. Um, yeah, I expected a lot more out of them. Josh Allen didn't really have a great game. Uh, honestly, he had a, a, a bad game by Josh Allen standards. Uh, only 147 yards in the air with one touchdown. Got sacked three times. And then on the ground, he had 10 carries for 47 yards and a touchdown. So obviously, it's always great when a quarterback gets a rushing touchdown. But when you're Josh Allen, y- you expect a lot more from him. Yeah, I- I've been defending Josh Allen a lot this year and saying, you know, he's going to have those games where he's not a superhuman and he's got those games where he's just not, you know, him and. I'm going to keep saying that because, I mean, I think for most quarterbacks, uh, only he, he doesn't really, he do, didn't really have, a, he, I think it was just like a really just a mediocre game. I wouldn't even say a good game. Uh, he got in there, got the job done, obviously, but he just did not look good. And I understand, you know, you have your bad days. Not, you can't be a superhero every day. Or, but he just didn't really. I, I don't really know if it's him or if it's the, uh, you know just everybody's having is just like playing soft or something. And so when they get in the playoffs, they surprise everybody again. But yeah, they're just. Um, I, I I just feel like they could be playing better than what they are. Yeah, I agree, and and you also have to kind of commend the defense. Um, this Jets team has a good offense, um, you know, despite. Mike White filling in in the last couple of weeks and a couple of the running backs already uh, getting banged up. Um, the Jets are a good team and 
the Bills completely stopped them. So, um, big up on that. It looks like the Jets got a safety, which is awesome. There's nothing better than a safety. I love when people get safeties. But, yeah, I don't think there's really much else to talk about with this game. Um, You got anything else for them? Not really. Um, I mean, I I have to kind of go off what you were saying. Very happy uh, about their defense. I love when the defense steps up uh, to make up for their offense not being, you know, all there. But, uh, yeah, I I just think that uh, offense for the Bills needs to step up. And back to – and then on the Jets, uh, definitely it's still in a rebuild, and they're looking really good for the future. Yeah. Um, We're getting to – Bengals Browns, uh, a rematch from the Halloween night game where the Browns kind of put a beating on the Bengals. The Bengals are out for blood right now. A- ain't nobody stopping them. Bengals win at 23 10. Joe Burrow, 18 for 33, 239 in the air, two touchdowns and an interception. Uh, Joe Mixon comes back uh, for the first time in, I believe, two or three weeks. 14 carries, 96 yards. Like, the offense gets it done. Jamar Chase, he's back in the lineup. I think this is his second week back. 10 receptions, 119 for one touchdown. Uh, I know the fantasy owners weren't very happy about T. Higgins. He was out, and then he was active. He gets in on one play, and then they pull him off the field for the rest of the game. Which is kind of crazy, but no matter what, the Bengals got it done, and that's really what counts. Um, Deshaun did have a better game this week than last week. 26 for 42, 276 in the air with a touchdown and an interception. But what hurt the Browns here is they couldn't get it done on the ground. Um, Nick Chubb, you're like one of the best running backs in the league, had 14 carries for 34 yards. Like That is unacceptable from a guy who, at a point in this season... Some people were thinking he was rushing for 2,000. Yeah, um, I agree. This uh, this running game by the Browns needs to really uh, step up some because, like you said, they do have a top five running back in the league in their backfield. And uh, you can't always put it on the running back. Sometimes, you know, they do just make poor – they have poor judgment and don't go for the holes their linemen give you. But usually when you're having such uh, trouble on the ground, it's because your offensive line is not getting it done up front and you're losing the battle in the trenches. And um, that's, uh, especially for this Browns team, when you have a, a running back as good as Nick Chubb, you got to utilize him a lot. And it just and it seems like they're just unable to. So they, for them to want to get back to you know going to the playoffs again, they need to figure that out there, getting uh, – Nick Chubb, making sure he's able to run the ball and successfully run the ball. And then uh, good for Deshaun Watson. I think I said it last week. He is – he's going to – it's going to be a, almost a learning process again because he uh, – I said it last week. He's been out for two years just about. So it's going to take a while for him to get back into being football condition, football – you know, getting his football IQ back up, getting back used to everything. So uh, he definitely is better than last week, but there's still uh, he he just needs to keep this you know each week getting better and better so he can go back to what uh, we know uh, Deshaun Watson as. And then on the uh, Bengal side, uh, I I mean they're just firing firing on all cylinders. Everything's looking good for them. Everybody coming back health. This is, was a great time for everybody to come back in to be back and be healthy. To, so they're all, you know, gelled back together and looking good for the playoffs. Yeah, uh, I I said a couple weeks ago that I thought the, Bang- the Bengals were going to make it to the Super Bowl, and, and right now they look unstoppable. They beat the Chiefs last week, which looks super good. And then, um, you know, anytime you can beat a division opponent, it, it looks really good. So um, – it's a big win for the Bengals, and uh, they just got to keep riding off this. Uh, they're playing great football. Uh, we will go and to a game that did not have very great football. Uh, the 1-11-1 Texans 
taking on the Cowboys. The Cowboys take it 27 to 23 and the Texans had the lead um I, I guess like the whole second half uh until the Cowboys had the comeback in the fourth. It was extremely surprising. Yeah, uh when I was checking in on this game, I was very shocked to see uh the Texans uh leading that game in the second half and I was kind of hoping for the downfall of the Cowboys there, but they were able to pull it out at the end. And I, you know, I say it each week, there's always, you know, every team's going to have their off game and not look too good. But I mean, you can't have your off. I mean, it's good. They had it to uh, the worst team in the league, but you can't play that bad against a team. That's one 11 and one. Yeah. Like the Texans are bad. Like, you know, they're bad when, you look at the box score and you see that Jeff Driscoll was in the game. <laughs> but, like, for Dallas, uh, I think I'm willing to say that Zeke and Tony Pollard are the, I'd probably say one of, if not the best running back duo in the league. And that primarily comes from Tony Pollard's ability to run and um, his abilities in the receiving game. He's consistently doing great things in the receiving game. He's got he got four receptions, twenty yards, and a touchdown. And then on the ground, ten carries, forty two yards, and a touchdown. So, I, I really think that those two in the backfield could make a huge impact on what the Cowboys are able to do in the playoffs. Yeah. But yeah, there's not much else to talk about with that game, um, other than the Cowboys coming back and winning it. But um, we'll get into Lions Vikings, uh, probably one of the bigger upsets of the week. Lions take it thirty four twenty three, and this, I think this was a surprise to all. Like Kirk had a great game. The, the Vikings in general had a pretty good game outside of the running game. Detroit just looked great. Yeah, uh, very shocking that the uh, seeing it's still so crazy to me to see the you know Lions win football games. Uh, but yeah, um, they just look better. I mean, I said it. I say that some teams. Yeah, you can look great, but at the end of the day, you can look great, but the other team can still outplay you. So, and I think uh, this week the Lions definitely just outplayed the Vikings. They wanted it more. Yeah, and I would have liked to have seen on the Vikings side a little bit more effectiveness in the offense. Like Kirk Cousins had, he was 31 for 41, 425 yards and two touchdowns. He didn't turn the ball over at all. Like Kirk played a great game. And Justin Jefferson went insane. 11 receptions, 223 yards, set the Vikings franchise record for um, receiving yards in a game. And it just seemed like nobody else did anything. Dalvin had 15 carries for 23 yards. Alexander Madison had two carries for negative one yards. And then, like, Hawkinson was involved in the passing game, but he committed a fumble. Dalvin fumbled. Like, they were falling apart at the seams, and Detroit just couldn't be stopped. Uh, this, you know, that we say it all the time when we talk about football. And football, there are two things you have to do. One, you have to be able to run the football. Because at the end of the day, no matter how good you are at passing the ball, well, if you can stop them, if you can at least hold them, you know, you stop them a few times, then passing, you're going to end up winning the game. And two, the turnover battle. You cannot give up turnovers. Whoever wins the turnover battle wins the game, I think. I don't remember the exact statistic, but it's like over 90% of the time. If you win the turnover battle, you'll win the football game. And obviously, the Lions did both there. They were able to they stop the Vikings uh, from rushing the ball, and they won the turnover battle. Yeah, and I think there's a couple of questions that kind of arise from this game. Um, obviously, people are going to say that the Vikings are frauds. I don't think they are. Uh, they still have a great offense. Uh, the defense just wasn't there today. 
And the, it's not like the Lions are a bad team. Uh, they've gotten a little bit unlucky with uh, health uh, just across the board. But when all the guys are back, Jamison Williams is back, his first game back, one reception for 41 yards and a touchdown. Like, there's guys on this team that can make an impact. And I think the biggest question here is if the Lions kind of turn it around here, they've they've got a chance to make the playoffs. Do you think Jared Goff is, is still going to be the answer? Because the Detroit Lions right now are looking at the third or fourth pick from the Rams, and they'd be in a great spot to pick up one of the quarterbacks. I think you would have to go for one of these quarterbacks in this draft class if you get a top four, top five pick because, I mean, Jared Goff is good and he has his moments, but I kind of, he, to me, he's just only, he's just the slightly better Baker Mayfield. He can win you some football games and he'll have his moments, but when he has a bad game, it's terrible. Yes, but I, I mean, like, if, if Jared Goff can string together some performances that you know, really wow the coaches and wow the front office, I, I see no reason to move on from him right now. I, I think maybe you could still pick one of those quarterbacks and let him sit for a couple of games, see how it goes. But when you've got a guy like Jared Goff, who has shown that he's talented, he's been to a Super Bowl. I, I feel like people forget that. He led that team to a Super Bowl, and he he is he can make a difference in a game. He has that ability. It's just about when can that be pulled out of him, because we see it all the time where he just goes on like a dry streak for a couple of weeks and he he just stumbles. But he can have performances like today, and he can do that relatively often, and I think that's valuable to a franchise. But, like you said, it's hard to pass up on the opportunity to pick one of these quarterbacks uh, when you've got a top five draft pick. Yeah, I think, like in my like, in my opinion, yeah, give him the chances, and if he does keep being better, you know, you can always uh, give that uh, younger quarterback that you draft. If Jared Goff just let's say you draft him, and then the next season you start him, he becomes a superstar. All right, then you just have a very uh, backup quarterback with a lot of potential. Who, that's I mean, that's some uh, you can you know trade him away for if you need to, whatever. But I think as of right now, you gotta you cannot pass up the opportunity with especially with these quarterbacks in this draft class. It, from just the way they look in college, I, we don't know exactly what they're gonna look like in the uh, in the league because you know it's almost impossible to say that they're gonna be great in the league or not. But I think this will be. You got to take, you know, Bryce Young or CJ Stroud or one of these guys in this draft class. You just have to. Because Jared Goff has not, like, to me, has not proven that, has not fully proven himself. And why take that full risk on him? Yeah. Yeah. I see where you're coming from. Uh, but we'll get into the next matchup, which is kind of the next upset of the week the Jacksonville Jaguars beat the Tennessee Titans 36-22, and this was all Trevor Lawrence. This was the Trevor Lawrence game. 30 for 42, 368 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions, didn't even get sacked once. Like, Trevor Lawrence put on a clinic today. Can I just, can we shout out my boy Evan Ingram? Holy crap, he had himself a fear day. I mean, I believe it was what uh, I, I don't remember the exact statistics. Yeah, I, I've got it up. I'll, I'll read it off because it, it is truly amazing, especially when you realize that it was Evan Ingram that did it. Eleven receptions, a hundred sixty-two yard, two touchdowns. And I mean, this is what people were expecting from him when he was drafted, especially after his rookie year. You know, he, uh, I think people forget he sat, I believe, like three or four like NFL rookie records. Uh, both for his, uh, I had his position, and he set uh, several uh, records with the New York Giants as a rookie. And so, this is the type of game people were expecting from Evan Ingram. Yeah, he went and had some not the best, you know, not doing too well later with the uh, Giants. They released him, but I think since he's been at a uh, been down there in Jacksonville with uh, 
Trevor Lawrence, he's looked so much better. Yeah, he has for sure. And they've actually got like a good amount of options in the passing game. Zay Jones has been a pretty consistent target throughout the year. Christian Kirk is obviously a pretty good wide receiver. Agnew, Marvin Jones Jr. Like you have some some guys that have spent a little bit of time in the league now that are true pass catchers. And then um, they didn't really do much in the run game, but at the same time, they didn't really have to. Uh, it was a lot of long, long plays um, for Jacksonville. So um, getting up the field and, and doing it successfully. Uh, whereas on the Titans side, Derrick Henry had a good game if you just look at his rushing. But the guy lost two fumbles. Like, how did Derrick Henry fumble the ball? Yeah, how does that giant, the giant six foot two, two hundred and sixty five pounds of pure muscle, fumble these footballs? Twice? Yeah, it, and when things happen like that, it forces the offense to get on the back of the quarterback. And Ryan Tannehill is just not that kind of quarterback. You can't put the offense in his hands. Like well, he didn't and- even have a bad game, but he he doesn't have the ability to truly make a difference through the passing game. Well, yeah, and I'm going to reiterate what I've said a bazillion times before. They traded away a top five wide receiver in the league. For what? If they would have kept, because they had the best, arguably the best running back in the league with Derrick Henry, and then they had a top five wide receiver, so all they needed was Ryan Tannehill, who is, you know, just drew. Honestly, a run-of-a-mill quarterback, he'll, he can put the ball where it needs to be. He can win you the football games. But then they trade away their, their, their best weapon, and now they're well, basically fully relying on Derrick Henry to be the, their, their offense. But let's be honest, A.J. Brown didn't fit the way that Ryan Tannehill plays. Tannehill isn't going to be chucking the ball downfield, and I think that's what A.J. Brown has done so well with the Eagles this year. Yeah, they can use him for screens, but A.J. Brown does best when he's got just a straight post route and he's got the opportunity to truly show his catching ability and his speed and physicality, whereas when he was playing for Tennessee, you can't really just send him straight down the field because Tannehill can't make the throw. Well, and then that goes to your coaching. You know, if you you got to play towards your players, and obviously when they chose to trade uh, A.J. Brown away, they were picking Ryan Tannehill. They, they'd rather have Ryan Tannehill, a quarterback who can just win you football games, than switching, up to where the, than switching to where they could be a better team. Yeah, and I think it is hurting the Titans uh, to not have A.J. Brown, but they're – most likely still going to make the playoffs. They'll probably win this division because it's such a weak one. But I don't see them making any any significant impact on the playoffs. Like, in the past couple of years, they've they've been there and they've been a team that people don't want to come up against. But when you see how many problems they're having, especially with just keeping the ball, like they're turning the ball over a lot, when a team is coming up against them, they they don't feel as threatened, and they're they're able to just take over and and win the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. I just I I just think they made. A, I just will say it every single time we talk about them. It was just a poor decision there. I can't believe they chose Ryan Tannehill over AJ Brown. Yeah, but uh, we'll, we'll move into. One of the, uh, just an absolute beatdown. The Philadelphia Eagles beat the New York Giants 48-22, and it really shouldn't have even been that close. Like, I I feel like the, even just the halftime score was probably a better representation. It it was 24-7 at halftime, and and Philly just looked dominant. Like, Jalen Hurts had a great game in the air. He had a great game on the ground. Miles Sanders was just doing his thing. Like, they looked really good. And it's what we needed to see from the Eagles. Um, A a late-in-the-season divisional opponent just truly... And it's a, a divisional opponent away game. Walk in there and just kick some ass. 
That's what we needed to see if they want to prove that they really are the best team in the league. Yeah, I agree. This game really does just kind of look just to me, just shows like, hey, we like exactly what you said. We are the team. We are the best team in the league. We are going to show we're the best. And I mean, I'll give this to uh, the Giants. I expected a little. Uh, I was not expecting a lot from them for the season, and they had a great start to the season. They they've done pretty good so far, but you know, they they. I mean, obviously, they're they're still in a bit of a rebuilding as well as a uh, couple other teams here. But I just think they could be playing a little better, and I think that kind of reflects to. I've never really been the. Uh, I like Daniel Jones, but I don't think he's the answer at quarterback. But they also don't really. He, they don't really have too many just like superstars on that team, and their defense is kind of mediocre. Yeah, it, and I think that comes from a, a couple of missed opportunities in the draft, and maybe you know uh, addressing a need, but not quite getting the best thing available for them. Um, so that that kind of comes down to management, which has progressively changed over the years now with the Giants and I I I do think that there's a lot of good things to take so far from this season like the Giants are 7-5 and 1 and they've got it they still got a shot to make the playoffs and this is Brian Dable's first year so there's a lot of things to look at uh or at least look ahead to for the Giants but they're still in a position where let's say they don't make the playoffs they're still in a good spot in the draft to where there's going to be guys available that can make an impact. Yeah, I agree fully. I I, just, I think this is really going to give them great hope for the future. I just think there, like you said, there there's a lot of missed opportunities in uh in previous years that I kind of hold against them still. <laughs> yeah, and, and I I do want to bring up one thing. Uh, I was looking at Todd McShay's newest uh his like early mock draft, and it had the Eagles taking Bijan Robinson. And I think that is such a bad idea. I, I understand that Miles Sanders is going to be a free agent, but Miles Sanders has been extremely, extremely good in Philadelphia. Yeah. And I would probably be willing to just give him whatever it takes to keep him there because he works very well. He can. When they need him to be involved in the passing game, he can be a receiver. When they need him to run the ball like he did on Sunday, he can do it at an elite, elite level. I, I get that Bijan Robinson uh, appears to be a once-in-a-lifetime talent, but when you've already got a guy, why give up on him? Yeah, I agree. This it, it tends to, I see it happening a lot, and it just doesn't make sense to me. Why get rid? It's the same, you know. You get told this when you're little. Don't fix something that's not broke. You know, if it's working, then don't try to change it. Yeah, and, and like, I feel like a lot of teams make this mistake where they're like, "Oh, well, this guy was a great running back in college. That's just going to immediately translate to the NFL." That doesn't happen a lot. You don't see a lot of Saquon Barkley's just jump into the league and make an impact. There's a lot more guys where it takes them a couple of years to get adjusted to the league because when you're a running back and you've been facing guys that you know probably aren't going to make the NFL, probably aren't going to be NFL starters nonetheless, and now you got to try and shoot the A-gap against two guys that were like unanimous All-Americans in college. Like It, it is a completely different ballgame for running backs. And oh, yeah. It, it takes a lot of time to develop. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I mean, it's that's something that I think people also forget in today's time. and It goes through every level, you know, when you're coming up from middle to high school, high school to college, college to NFL. People forget that, uh, forget the difference in the competition level. The competition level at, at the next level everywhere is always a hundred times harder than where it was. And so it takes time to adjust. Like you were saying. So I just think, I agree. I definitely think Philadelphia needs to, they can draft uh, 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 B. John Robinson and then they can have, you know, a possible dual, uh, dual threat there. Bas- basically triple threat running with Miles Sanders, uh, Jalen Hurts, as B. John Robinson uh, gets adjusted uh, quickly like they hope. 
have him as well. And then at, at receiver, have uh, Jalen Hurts and – or sorry, uh, A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. That's a very high-powered offense you'll have there because you'll have uh, two running backs that can, uh, you know, go back and forth, switch in and out, kind of like uh, Zeke and Tony Pollard down at uh, Dallas, so they can, you know, always stay rested. But yeah, I don't think the, they – With those three in the running game, Miles Sanders, B. Sean Robinson, and Jalen Hurts, they might as well just run the triple option. <laughs> yeah, literally, you go back to the wing T. <laughs> <laughs> like, that would be ridiculous, having all three of those guys on the field. Yeah, that would be insane. And I think – and, I mean, you would control the clock and you control every game if you have all three of them. Yeah, that would be ridiculous. Uh, but we'll go ahead and uh, move on to uh, another divisional matchup that um, – it, it meant a lot so far to the Ravens season, and that's going to be Ravens-Steelers. They take it 16-14. And uh, no Lamar Jackson this week. Tyler Huntley gets the start, but they really put the hand or they put the game in the hands of the running game, and it paid off. Uh, obviously, not a fantastic offensive performance, only putting up 16 points. Luckily, you're playing the Steelers, so 16 points can normally do it for you. <laughs> um, J.K. Dobbins, 15 carries, 120 yards, and a touchdown. Gus Edwards, 13 carries, 66 yards. Uh, they did what they needed to to win. Uh, Tyler Huntley didn't really pass the ball. He only had 12 attempts. But when you're able to run the ball at will uh, against a team that is, is definitely a threat when it comes to pass defense, it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and uh, like you said, they did. Exa- they did. They they know they don't have Lamar Jackson. They don't have their star quarterback in there, and they said. We know we got to rely very heavily on the uh, on our run game, and they proved it that they have a very strong running game. Like you said, they had two uh, running backs with a pretty. They had uh, uh, J.K. Dobbins had a really good day, and uh, the other guy had a uh, pretty solid day too. Six six yards isn't too, uh, anything to uh, be upset about. And they, uh, re- I mean, re- you got to do what you got to do, and. I mean, when you don't have someone like Lamar Jackson out there who basically, like I think I've said it before, they Lamar Jackson is that offense. He, him being able to do all the crazy things he does, is the reason that offense is so successful, and they know that there. So that's why a week like this, they just re- did a very, very much just ran the ball. Yeah, and then, and then on the other sideline, uh, Kenny Pickett gets hurt pretty early in the game. Mitch Trubisky comes in and had a vintage Mitch Trubisky performance. He went 22 for 30, 276 yards and a touchdown. He had eight incompletions, three of them interceptions. Like that is that is such a Mitch Trubisky line, but they they couldn't get it done on the ground. And though Deontay Johnson and George Pickens and even Pat Fryermuth had pretty good games, it's just not enough. It, Mitch Trubisky doesn't get it done. If you're giving up the ball three times, like it, it's just not going to work in your favor. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to restate something I said earlier. You have, if you want to win a football game, you have to win the turnover battle, especially in a game that the final score is 16 14. You don't turn the ball over three times. You, that's three more opportunities you have to go to the end zone. Yeah, it's super important, especially when it comes to both of these teams having injuries to their starting quarterback. You need a run game to rely on. The Ravens did it well, the Steelers didn't, and that's what it came down to. Yeah, I I agree. But uh, we'll go to, um, surprisingly, one of the Broncos' better offensive performances so far this year. But they still lost because they were playing Kansas City. Uh, Kansas City gets the win, 34-28. And, you know, Patrick Mahomes, he, he did his thing outside of the three interceptions. Uh, it's super surprising to me that it, that is even there. I, I feel like I haven't seen Patrick Mahomes throw that many interceptions in a single game. But 
the passing game got it done. Uh, uh, obviously, the turnovers didn't help, but Pat Mahomes had 352 in the air and three touchdowns. That's an undeniable performance. Isaiah Pacheco had a pretty good impact on the ground, 13 carries, 70 yards. And then when it came to the receiving game, Jarek McKinnon, just out of nowhere, the backup running back, seven receptions, 112 receiving yards, and two touchdowns, all receiving. Like, that is a ridiculous game from your running back. Yeah, that is a crazy game from your running back. You, that that That's something you would, like, I couldn't even, if I was thinking of something crazy for a running back, I never would even think that. Um, I mean, he's a Georgia Southern boy. That's why he did so good. Gotta be. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, uh, those. I I think the the better offensive game is because those three interceptions Pat Mahomes threw. Um, I mean, it, it just all that does is just give the other offense the opportunity to score more points, and I really think that's why it was a much closer game is the Broncos' offense was given you know, three more times to potentially score uh, points. So, But uh, they, they did look much better this game. I'll give them that. Yeah, they did. They, they capitalized on the turnovers. And, and Russell Wilson had a, a pretty solid game. 23 for 36, 247, three touchdowns, one interception. But he got sacked six times for 49 yards. Like, yeah. That just cannot happen. Yeah, that that right there is the difference between winning and losing. I mean, giving up what do you say, forty nine yards? Yeah, you can't do that. And you know, usually a lot of sacks tend to happen in uh, in very important situations. And so that I'm sure I, I can't recall exactly, but I mean, you you can't give up forty nine yards in of sack yardage. That's just especially from a veteran quarterback who shouldn't have more um, pocket awareness and being able to throw the ball away when needed or, you know, uh, run the ball, whatever it is. You, you don't expect a veteran quarterback to have something like that unless the dang offensive line is just playing horrible. Yeah, you, you got to give it to the Chiefs for um, fighting through the turnovers. Um, you know, Three turnovers, it, it's tough to win a game when you turn the ball over that many times. But uh, when it comes to offensive efficiency, they're just able to get it done. And they do that week in and week out, and that's why they are one of the best franchises. Uh, they're genuinely building a dynasty. I know they've lost some guys over the years, but when you've got Patrick Mahomes and you've got Travis Kelsey, it, it's hard to lose. Yeah, I think I've said this uh, in one of the early weeks of this uh, podcast is, they are built to win. They are built to where they can lose, you know, a Tyree kill and still have an exceptional offense. And uh, that's, I mean, like you said, they have uh, one of the, one of the greatest uh, up, up and coming quarterback. I mean, he's not really up and coming anymore, but one of the greatest younger quarterbacks and an amazing tight end to compliment him. So you are set up for success. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, another team that's set up for success, the San Francisco 49ers. They beat the Buccaneers 35-7. to And Brock Purdy is looking like the future. Nah, yeah. I'm kidding. He, he had a good game, but, you know, it's not like he had any kind of, like, major, major game. Like, it wasn't the Brock Purdy coming out party. Like. 16 for 21, 185, two touchdowns. Look, Kyle Shanahan understands that this is Brock Purdy's second game. Like, you got to take it easy on the kid. And he gave him just the right amount of opportunities to make this offense work. Like, Brock Purdy having a QB rating of 92.8 in his second start in the NFL against the Buccaneers is amazing. And then they got it done on the ground as well. Christian McCaffrey finally had like an insanely good rushing game. 14 carries, 119 for one touchdown. And unfortunately, Debo went out later in the game. 
he also had a pretty good game. And I, I just think that this 49ers team is, is built for anything. You could literally plug in whatever quarterback that you want in this team, and they're gonna play, they're gonna play well and they're gonna win. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I was actually gonna say something very similar to that is they Brock Purdy is very similar to uh Jimmy Garoppolo is and he looks to just be a consistent quarterback. He can get the ball to the players. He can get the ball to the uh, people who, you know, who can do something with the ball. He's not really uh, – I mean, I, I don't think he's doing anything too special. Like you said, he, this wasn't his coming out party or anything. But he is being very consistent, and that's all you need uh, right now, especially from a rookie quarterback. Um, I don't think uh, – again, I don't really think he's anything special, so I wouldn't be too concerned if I was Jimmy G. But – Right now, it's kind of looking like Brock Purdy is just the younger version of Jimmy G. Yeah, he he fits into this offense, and he, he I didn't even think about that, but yeah, that, that's a great point. Jimmy Garoppolo and Brock Purdy are pretty similar quarterbacks. Like they're not gonna, you know, have a, a ridiculous game. They're they're not often gonna go over three hundred passing yards. They're not gonna start running all over the place but they can sit in the pocket, they're mobile in the pocket, and they can just kind of develop plays and, and let them happen in front of them and, and make the right decisions. So I, I think Brock Purdy looks really good. Do I think he's going to be a superstar? No. Um, I, I think he could end up getting a starting job somewhere in the future, but I don't even think he's really the answer to the 49ers. But I think his performance is just a testament to how good this team is. And, and obviously, the light has to be shined on the defense. We talk about them every single week. The 49ers defense is the best in the league. I know the Buccaneers are struggling, but it's still Tom Brady. And it's still Chris Godwin and Mike Evans and Leonard Fournette. Like These are elite guys, and it doesn't matter. The 49ers defense will stop anybody. As you know, I am a very big defensive guy. I love, 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 love watching low-scoring defensive games because I always play defense, and that's always what I, I just find interesting. When I, I mean, one day I, wanna, I hopefully will be able to coach, uh, a, be a defensive coordinator one day. I, that's what I want to do. I love good defensive games. And this, this 49ers defense is a great one to look at to just show i mean they are just they are tough and they are strong they're a very strong defense and i just love watching them one thing i do uh i have to say for the niners i kind of agree with uh jerry rice i don't like i like debo uh, samuel i like how they use him i i just hate when they run him up the middle and when uh they put him up against you know those big old linebackers your skilled players are not built to be running up the middle against, you know, uh, 300-pound defensive linemen, you know, 280-pound, thick, strong, pure-muscle linebackers. That's not who your skill players are meant to be going against. So I I, I don't like when they uh, use him up the middle, and, you know, that's kind of how we got hurt, and that's very unfortunate. So I hope hope they can learn from that. Yeah, like, I, I actually wrote down a note about that Jerry Rice tweet. Because I, I think he's got a great point. Like, why should Debo Samuel be running up the middle and running into Levante David? That should never happen. Like, you are just causing yourself more problems. I get that Debo Samuel can run the ball, but he he is a wide receiver. And you need to use him like that primarily. He got five targets, and he got four carries in this game. Like, it it shouldn't be a split share. Debo Samuel needs to play receiver, and he needs to get targets. And running the ball with him is useless. Look, you could use Ayuk. I think Ayuk is a little bit more of a running back than Debo Samuel, but you still have Christian McCaffrey. And you still have Jordan Mason. Like those guys can get it done themselves. You don't need Debo Samuel trying to get tough yardage. Yeah, I I, I agree. I've 
the whole every time I've watched them for a few years, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Why you're bringing in a skilled position to go someone who's you know six three, two hundred and fifteen pounds against someone who's six foot four, two hundred and sixty five pounds, and can bench you know the freaking world and squat the freaking sun? Like you can't. That that's like that's common knowledge. You just don't do that. But he gets paid a lot more money to do that than I than uh, I do. So fair enough. But uh, <laughs> we'll go to um, another one of the uh, four o'clock slates. Um, Carolina taking on Seattle. Carolina actually pulls away with the win, thirty to twenty-four. Uh, Sam Darnold starting for the Panthers this week, and. I think this game was a similar thing to what we were just talking about with the 49ers, where they didn't want to force Sam Darnold into having to make a huge impact on this game. He just needed to do what he needed to do, and that was hand off the ball and pass when you need to. 14 for 24, 120 with a touchdown. I will take that every day from Sam Darnold. Limiting the turnovers with Sam Darnold, is the key. And when you just let him hand the ball off, when you've got two guys in the backfield that are really skilled, Chuba Hubbard, great player, Dante Foreman, another great one. Like, yeah, they're not like top tier running backs in this league, but they can get it done. And that's exactly what they did today or Sunday. Yeah. Um, to speak on the, uh, Seahawks side is their offense didn't seem to, didn't look too bad. I think, the uh, biggest thing the Seahawks Seahawks team is they they got to get uh they they got to work on their defense this off season because I think they're pretty set uh offensively I mean they have still have Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf they have Kenneth Walker at running back and uh, Geno Smith has been playing very well I definitely think this off season they've lost you know everyone of uh, every defensive player of prominence they've had in uh recent years have uh you know either been traded away or retired so i definitely think for them uh in the future to be uh super bowl contender uh contenders you know divisional uh title winners they need to really work on that defense yeah and obviously they still have guys and they've got a couple of really good young guys uh kobe bryant out of uh i, I believe he came from cincinnati um Boye Mafe is very good. Bruce Irvin it, it still makes an impact on the game. Like, there is bright spots on the Seahawks defense, but it, it's really just about getting a, a full unit there. and It's just something they don't quite have. But um, there's not too much else to say about this game um, that we haven't already said. Is there anything else you wanted to put out there? No, not really. Just get uh, just, uh, piggyback on what you were saying. Just they, they got to fi- uh... – Fill those holes on defense, and I mean they lost uh, probably their biggest leader in uh, Bobby Wagner this off season, which I know he was getting uh, older and up there, which uh, I understand why they did, but they need to they need another just leader on that defense, a new leader. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we will go down to Los Angeles Chargers taking on the Dolphins. Uh, they pull out the win, twenty three seventeen. And this kind of goes back to what we have been talking about over the past couple of weeks with the Chargers is that, look, Justin Herbert is a, a superstar quarterback and you just got to let him do his thing. And he sure as hell did his thing on Sunday. 39 for 51, 367, one touchdown. Like, Justin Herbert looked so good in this game, especially when they couldn't really get the run game going. They were giving Eckler opportunities. He just quite, he, he couldn't quite break out. So having Herbert able to just stay composed in, in a very close game it is super important. Yeah, I agree. Um, he does, he's just such a good quarterback and he does really have a bright future ahead of him. When they play him right, it, they look really good, but uh, and uh, some of their losses, they just did not use him, pro- utilize him properly at all. And uh, uh, they're looking the offensive line looked a little better this week, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, but, they uh, still gave up four sacks, but uh, I think what's important to note with this Chargers offense this week is that there was a, 
a lot of their weapons were back. They finally have Eckler, Allen, and Mike Williams all in the lineup, and you can see it in the box score that it, it, it really changes the game for them. Yeah. That, uh, that is, that, that, oh my goodness, I cannot speak, sorry. Um, yeah, having your weapons back obviously does make a difference because, you know, they're called your weapons for a reason. <laughs> but, um, yeah, having everybody back and being back to healthy, I mean, just like look at the um, uh, Bengals. With everyone being back, they look like an unbeatable, not unbeatable, but look like one of the uh, top teams in the league right now. So that's something that uh, is always great to happen when everybody, especially towards the end of the year, when you need everybody to be 100% and they're all coming back. So this will, this is looking really good for them going into uh, the playoffs. Yeah, and then for the Dolphins, like this this offense looked very bad, probably the worst it's looked all season. Uh, Tua only got 145 passing yards. He only completed 10 passes. And then in the run game, they only had 19 carries as a team and 92 yards. Like they couldn't get it done either way. And uh, obviously that that shows in the score but they looked so bad like it, probably the worst we've seen them this whole year yeah i can't even begin to say uh how disappointed i am with that offense not only because i uh, i have jalen waddle in my fantasy and he only got me 5 points this weekend but um they just they just did not look good at all. I mean, yeah, they scored 17 points, but they just looked terrible. Yeah, it, it was a, a, a pretty bad performance for them. But uh, we'll get into uh, the Monday night football game. Patriots taking on the Cardinals. And not a ton going on here. Um I, I think it's pretty obvious that the biggest storyline is Kyler Murray going out, uh, I believe, in the first quarter. Uh, turns out, torn ACL. Yeesh. He's going to be out for the season. That sucks. Um, yeah, we've, we've talked our crap about Kyler Murray this year, but y- you never want to see a guy like that go down. So, um, you know, hopefully he comes back uh, next year. Uh, he should have plenty of time to recover before the next season and um, gets back to uh, what, what we like to see from Kyler Murray, which is just that super fun, explosive player that we saw in his rookie season. But um, on the Patriots' side, uh, Ramondre Stevenson, who's another one of their big weapons, he got hurt as well in the game. It, this game was just uh, tough for injuries. But... The Patriots still end up pulling it out. Mac Jones has a pretty good game. Uh, Pierre Strong Jr. and Kevin Harris came in, kind of filled the role for Ramondre Stevenson, um, got the the tough yardage. Um, They only had a combined 13 carries, but they still put up almost 100 rushing yards and two touchdowns between the two of them. So... uh, a, a strong performance uh, for for really both teams, uh, despite the early injuries. I think this game uh, definitely shows like I I obviously don't know if this is true or not, but it kind of looked to me like, especially towards the end of the game, they just kind of let Mac Jones take control, and when he did, they looked much better on offense. Um, that's just my opinion from kind of what I noticed. Uh, again, I could be wrong, but it looks like they kind of let him go out there and just control the game and uh, just uh, and take care of it, basically. And I, they just look so much better when, when uh, that happens. Um, again, uh, to kind of say what you said, I did say a lot of, you know, crap about Tyler Murray, but again, I hate seeing, uh, especially very talented players like that, go down. Um, I, ho- I, uh, I really hope he does get better recovers quickly. But one thing that is with kind of the modern quarterback right now is especially some uh, 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 like I, I mean kind of what we said with uh Debo Samuel the old players aren't meant to be hit this much and this hard by these big interior D linemen and linebackers and so when you when you have a quarterback especially the modern quarterback now 
where they're where they run as much as they run, there are going to be a lot more injuries with uh, these quarterbacks. Yeah, and the Kyler Murray one was, um, I believe I saw that it was non-contact, but you know that that means that prior to that there was problems happening. So um, yeah, it, it's it's hard to gauge um, the the true impact that it's having on these quarterbacks and on you know any of the school, skill position players when they're just getting worked. But we see so many guys going out. Like so, Kyler, Debo, um, uh, Lamar Jackson, like all of these guys are getting just absolutely beat up, and, it, and it's just because they're two-dimensional players, and, and it's just their play style. But at a certain point, offensive coordinators and head coaches just kind of need to take a stance and, and just you know make the executive decision to use what you already have. Uh, stop making players do things that somebody else could do and can do at a higher level. Yeah, I think that goes a little differently for the Debo Samuel situation because that was the offensive coordinator and head coach's fault for running him up the middle like he's a big old running back. But for uh, I, I did agree with, like, especially with quarterbacks, you need to just say, like, hey, like, yeah, this is good you doing this, but sometimes – don't don't run the ball if you can only get a get one or two yards. Just throw the ball away. You know, if it's first, second down, hell, even third third down, if you can only get, you know, two yards, you need eight, just throw the ball away. It's not worth putting yourself at injury. Yeah. Um it, Oh, sorry. It, just it, something else on injuries I want to say is the NFL makes so much money and has so much money. No and I understand there are a lot of domes. But there, I'm, there should be a way that they can get real grass into these domes and inside uh, playing uh, venues because real grass, real natural grass, is significantly better on your joints, especially your knees and ankles and hips, than AstroTurf. Yeah, yeah, the, the turf fields and, like, looking at, you know, what injuries – even just this season have occurred on turf fields as opposed to grass fields. Uh, it, it, it is mind blowing. So obviously turf is like the new technology and it makes it easier on uh, like grounds crews and all that. But when it comes down to the safety of the players, I, I feel like, you know, you need to protect the product and players are 100% the product of the NFL. So I, uh, I think that if it keeps being this bad, the NFL has to do something about it. And this has been from when AstroTurf first came out. There's all ever since the first game on AstroTurf, they've had more issues with uh, injuries on AstroTurf, or not just AstroTurf. That's just artificial turf. Yeah, it, that's something that has been documented since the first game on artificial turf. And you would think a multi-billion dollar company like the NFL would be able to look at this and say, okay, this is the our players, our product, like you said. They're getting hurt a hundred times more on artificial turf as opposed to natural turf. How can we get artificial turf, or sorry, natural turf into the, uh, these indoor arenas and uh, uh, indoor venues and or something or make artificial turf as good as uh, natural grass because artificial turf is about an inch of artificial turf and then concrete yeah it, it's it's horrible and everybody just keeps doing it because it makes their life easier but when it comes down to the health and safety of players um, it, it just needs to change uh, but let's let's uh I think that'll do it for us for the NFL this week. Uh, let's get into this MLB offseason news. Uh, a lot has happened since our last episode. Really just some big deals. So uh, we'll start it off. Aaron Judge returning to the Bronx. He signs uh, a nine-year deal worth $360 million with the Yankees. And I, I feel like after it took a little bit long and, and we never saw um, much coming out of it, 
I thought that the Yankees were going to re-sign him at that point. Um, I didn't really want him to go back. I, I think it would be interesting to see Aaron Judge play somewhere else. Um, I, I think he would have fit in really well in San Fran. But, you know, when you get that kind of money offered to you, you can't turn it down. Um, you got anything on this one? Just... I like uh, when players go somewhere and they decide this isn't my team and I don't want to play anywhere else. It's always it's always nice when you know the hometown. Well, I, I I don't know where he's from, but he's from um, I believe California. Well, when yeah, the he you know he started with them and uh, goes through. It's always nice to start into. Uh, it's always nice to see someone who started into their career somewhere, like Chipper Jones, Atlanta, Andrew Jones, Atlanta. You know, and it just brings. Well, he didn't, but. I thought he did. No, he. I think he ended with the Yankees. Oh well, boo. <laughs> yeah. All I know is he lives in Atlanta. But like, yeah. um, yeah. It's just it's always nice to see. Like it's you know, I think it's just a, a bigger bond between uh, them and the community when they do things like that. Yeah, and, and obviously Yankees fans really wanted him back. You, you hit sixty two home runs in a season. Uh, <laughs> you, they're they're gonna want you back. But yeah. we'll move on um, to a, a signing that actually kind of surprised me. After we saw the Cubs kind of spending a little bit of money here and there, like getting Cody Bellinger, picking up a couple of pitchers, I, I thought that Wilson Contreras was going to re-sign with the Cubs. But uh, it, it turns out that you know after they still didn't trade him at the deadline last year, that he still wanted to leave. So Wilson Contreras signs a five-year deal with the Cardinals, uh, Eighty-seven point five million, and he he will be the replacement for Yadier Molina. Yeah, I mean, good pickup by the Cardinals. Yeah, that that's huge for this team. Like that lineup it looks nasty. Like Goldschmidt, Arenado, O'Neill, Wilson Contreras. Now uh, they look so good, and I do not want to face them. But um, we can just go ahead and pass that one. Uh, Xander Bogarts signs with the Padres for 11 years, $280 million. And and this one uh, is interesting to me because it kind of threw the Red Sox into the market for the shortstops. And I think that's going to have an effect on the Braves' ability to re-sign Dansby. Uh, As of today, it looks like six teams are interested in Dansby Swanson. And, you know, the more teams that are involved in this, the harder it is for Atlanta to bring him back. Um, But, yeah, that, that Xander deal is great. Um, I'm interested to see what this means for Tatis when he comes back because you've already got Jake Cronenworth at second. You've got Ha Young Kim who can play second and short and a little bit of outfield. Now you got Bogarts who can really only play short, maybe some second base. And then you've got Machado who can play third and short. So I feel like their infield is kind of getting taken up. And um, I'm interested to see what happens to Fernando Tatis when he comes back from his suspension. Yeah, I agree. That's uh, that's going to be very interesting for him. I feel like uh, he'll at least be there for a little bit just because uh, you know the fans still love him out there. But, I mean, it's professional baseball. Whoever's the best is going to stay. Exactly. Um, you know, every year could change, but um, we'll go to another signing uh, this time for the Red Sox. Kenley Jansen signs a two year, $32 million deal with the Red Sox. And I, I didn't see him really coming back. Uh, he played pretty well. He had a couple of rough, uh, rough closes for us, but um, yeah, I, I feel like Rizal Iglesias proved himself uh, after we picked him up from the Angels. And it, it kind of has pushed Kenley Jansen out. So uh, I, I definitely saw him leaving. I didn't see or I didn't think that the Red Sox would really be buying. And they picked up one of the best closers of the past decade. So uh, it's, a, it's a great pickup for the Red Sox. Yeah. Uh, we'll go ahead and just move into the, uh, the, the big trade that happened um, earlier today. Um, or was it today or yesterday? I guess it was yesterday. Yeah. Um, 
So three team trade between the Braves, the Athletics, and the Brewers. And the Braves acquire Sean Murphy from the A's. The A's get the biggest haul from the three. Uh, they pick up prospect Roiber Salinas from Atlanta, Freddie Tarnock from Atlanta, Kyle Muller from Atlanta, Manny Pena from Atlanta, and they get Astori uh, Ruiz from Milwaukee. Um, a, a couple of guys that I, especially Kyle Muller, I wanted to see more of uh, in Atlanta, honestly. And then uh, the Brewers acquire Justin Yeager from the Braves and, sadly, William Contreras, Wild Bill. I, I hate to see him leave, but let's be honest. Look, we've got Ozuna for another year. He he's got a lot of money. He's got to be the DH. You can't just sit here and waste that money. And then when you have the opportunity, and, and Alex Anthopoulos came out and said this, when you've got the opportunity to pick up a guy like Sean Murphy, who uh, he's a gold glove catcher, he's got a plus bat, you'd be stupid to not make an offer. So I, I totally get it. And, and William Contreras is ha, has been great. He's had his moments. But when it all comes down to it, the opportunity to get a guy who I, I really think compares well to JT Romuto, you, you can't pass it up. Yeah, uh, I was gonna. I was thinking the same thing. Uh, you already said it though. When you have that opportunity, you cannot pass up an opportunity to take a, one of the top catch. Well, arguably the best catcher in the MLB right now. You know, top three. So th- th- you can't pass up that opportunity. And obviously, we didn't, and we took care of it. The only thing I, I don't like is I feel like in Atlanta we've just been depleting our uh, our minor system. Yeah, yeah, the farm system it, it it is there for a reason. And I think the Braves use it very well though. Yes, we deplete it, but you know, every year we're making good pickups and we're still keeping guys, obviously, but when you throw a couple prospects into a trade, it makes it a lot more enticing. So look, you brought up some very successful prospects this past year. You got the top two rookie of the year. Um, guys, the the winner of the Rookie of the Year. You brought up Von Grissom, who is a guy that right now it's looking like he he's got a spot next year if Dansby doesn't come back. Um, I could see him being you know not the everyday starter. Uh, I don't think he's quite ready for that at shortstop. But him and Arcia could definitely platoon shortstop, and I, I think that Von Grissom can be a long term option. We've got him for I think seven more years. It's going to be interesting. Uh, one thing that kind of threw me off with this trade, though, is when I first saw it, the only thing I could find was Sean Murphy to Atlanta. That's it. There was no players, nothing. And then, as a couple of minutes went by, I started seeing William Contreras going to the Brewers as part of this three-team trade where we would be getting Willie Adamez. And that made me think that, you know, the Dansby sweepstakes was over. The, the Braves had pulled out. And then the Braves released the uh, uh, official press release of the details of the trade. And now Willie Adamas is nowhere to be found. So I was super confused when this all came out. Um, obviously, you know, I shouldn't have trusted the Twitter replies on Ken Rosenthal's Twitter. But <laughs> it, it definitely threw me for a loop. But I, I'm going to be honest. I think Willie Adamas is amazing. He, he's a great shortstop, and he would have made an impact on his team. But I'm interested to see what we can do with Von Grissom. I, I don't see why people want him to be replaced. I get trying to sign a great shortstop. It's awesome. But when you've got a guy who who is young, he's definitely showed glimpses of being a great player. He's shown that he, he's got the glove. I think he can be the future here. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't know why people uh, won't. They, I mean, I, I actually, I, I understand why people do because the thought of, because especially in the uh, this past season, uh, how well Dansby Swanson played is I think people believe that if we get rid of, if uh, Dansby, if we can't resign Dansby and he goes elsewhere, we're missing, we're going to have this giant hole in the roster. But I think, uh, 
Von Grissom, uh, as, as you've been saying, will be a good uh, will be a good fit there to replace Dan, not to replace Dancy, but in, in upcoming years as he gets better, will be a better a replacement if Dansby does decide to go elsewhere. Yeah, and um, we can we can move on from the MLB. Obviously, you know the hot stove is burning, but uh, we'll just have to keep waiting on it. Um, and we'll move into the one and only college football outcome of the week, Army-Navy. Uh, Army gets the win over Navy 20-17, to and I know you have a lot more to talk about this game than me, so uh, feel free to give us the analysis. Um, as I stated last week, this was what football is supposed to be. It was a very tough, very hard fall game on both sides both sides gave their all the entire game uh mostly low scoring i believe they went into halftime 10 to 10 or sorry not halftime overtime either 10 to 10 or 17 17 i can't recall but i mean it was a great great game to watch um first army navy game to go into overtime uh i believe army scored the very first play of overtime, Navy tied it up going in. And I think Army ended up stopping Navy and they uh, kicked the field goal to win it in yep. second OT. And I mean, it was, I love watching the service academies play because it is rough, it is tough, and it is what you imagine. Fo- when, when you think of football, is what you imagine because it, 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 it is between the tackles, just powerful play oh i just love watching it uh, it's just it's great but what the biggest outcome that i was that took me by surprise is immediately following the game i think they said within like an hour coach uh ken uh Niamatololo, the navy head coach who's been there now for 15 years as the head coach um after going two and seven in the last uh seven games or his last nine games against the army i believe they're finally, go, they're finally, um, they decided to mu- mutually part ways, as in more like the athletic director walked in and said, you're done. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I think the, the most important part, you know, outside of the, the you know, Twitter kind of going crazy over how it happened uh, with his firing, uh, he was sitting alone in the locker room and the athletic director walks in and fires him. That's that is brutal. But uh, something that really pertains to the both of us is that one of the guys that's in conversations for the Navy job is former Navy offensive coordinator and current Kennesaw State University head coach Brian Bohannon. Um, I, I think obviously he fits the book, like. He played or he coached under uh, Paul Johnson at Southern, at Navy, and at Tech, and, and then where? And Hawaii. He coached at Hawaii. Yeah, I didn't know that. But um, yeah, so he, another one on the resume, like Brian Bohannon fits the bill for a service academy um, coaching job, and I I think, in my opinion, though. I think he's he would be making the wrong move. Oh uh, yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. I think going to a service academy, especially for him, going back to the naval academy, because I I know uh, we've talked to him before. Uh, we're not really family friends, but kind of, sort of. Uh, I played football with his sons, and my parents and his parents would sit together in the stands and uh, at banquets and stuff, and. They'd get to talking, and they talked about how much they loved their time at the Naval Academy. But I think uh, Brian Bohannon is perfectly content with staying at Kennesaw State because in the next two years, they'll be moving up to Division I uh, FBS level uh, to a Group of Five conference. I believe it's Conference USA. Yep. Uh, they, I, I think they're starting, what, 2024? Yeah, that'll be the first season. They're, they're technically in the transitioning phase this season. I think uh, he, I think Kennesaw State, they know that their football program is still struggling. Not 
performance on the field, but getting fans and building the culture. So I think if they were to, if Kennesaw State does not fight to keep keep him, he might leave because Navy, uh, the Naval Academy, especially nowadays, they're willing to they're willing to win, put some money into, put some money into it, and get a good coach. But I think another thing that might uh, Navy's also, uh, if you watched them a little more this year, which uh, they didn't do it a lot, but they are a little bit with Army too, and they have Jeff Munkin, one of the greatest uh, triple option coaches, uh, w- along with Paul Johnson. They're all kind of slowly starting to ease away from the triple option, but they still run it a little. But in modern day college football, especially at D1 FBS level, you cannot run a triple option offense just because it's you have to run it perfectly to a T. Everyone has to be perfect, and the slightest mistake will, you know, ruin the entire uh, drive for you. Will ruin all the momentum. So I don't think, I don't think they'll end up going with uh, Coach Bohannon because he is not. A, uh, he also still has, uh, I think, one child still in school, and I think they're perfectly yep. content with staying at where they are right now. And I bet that uh, <laughs> he'll probably use it as getting a little leverage, though. Yeah, uh, I think the the big thing here is that Brian Bohannon has completely built up this KSU football program like he he, what he was their head coach starting in I believe 2015 he started the football program there yeah which was um you know that football program at KSU um everybody can thank um Vince Dooley for that starting he was uh part of the group that um was brought in to start the uh, program there but yeah, he's been at KSU since 2013, um, and they they've done their thing. They were in the Big South. They they played rather well in a couple of years, 2017, 18, and 21. Uh, in particular, they were really good. Um, I believe only like one year they didn't. Only two years of him being there, they didn't make the playoffs. Uh, it is now. At four, so three four. years while they're in the Big South, uh, 2015, 2016. I don't think there was a playoff in 2020, so that could be one of them. And then, um, they didn't make it this year because they were absolutely horrible. But, four. um, oh, god, well, I was gonna say, uh, and I really hate it because I love the triple option offense because, uh, like I said, it is just traditional, just I am going to ground, I'm going to run this ball up your throat all game and prove that I'm tougher and better than you. And I just don't think with today's how football works today and skill positions and how everything is, you just can't run that offense and you can't get the players for it anymore. Like you. Cause no, you know, it's so tough and it's very, very difficult to run. So a lot of kids don't like to run it anymore. Yeah. Uh, I, I think what is important in this situation here with uh, Coach Bohannon is that, um, like you said, he has built that program. And how could he abandon them right before they're making the jump? Like, this is a quick turnaround. Like, this this program started uh, only a few years ago, and they're already making the jump to FBS. Uh, this is big. And, you know, they're at a school where it, it, it's now, like, the third or fourth highest populated university in Georgia. And, you know, people do care about this school. So they're making a big impact across all sports. Like they, what, they made a play in game for March Madness in the past couple of years. They made the call or they made it to um, the regionals for baseball. Like they are genuinely creating a very good program here and i think that brian bohannon can be a major part in you know the the history of this program i agree um the the one thing he just and i know it's really hard especially in a state like georgia where you have the traditional powerhouses like the university of georgia georgia tech not so much in recent years but you know if and if you look at them historically they're one of the uh very a traditional powerhouse it's very hard to get fans 
to stop, you know, liking them and focus and, you know, come to your games on a Saturday, especially when you're in FCS school. But I think moving to the next level, that's just, oh, that's the only thing they have left is making sure getting their students more involved in game days and coming to the games. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm guilty, but I have a job, so I don't go to the games. That but, is, um, <laughs> we'll, we'll move on from this. Uh, we can talk head coaching when it really comes to the off season. But um, I do want to go through all of the award winners uh, for the NCAA, uh, and, and I'll just kind of run through them, and we can converse a little about, uh, about it at the end. But uh, Will Anderson takes home the Bednarik Award. Max Duggan takes home the Davy O'Brien Award. Bijan Robinson, the Doak Walker Award. Uh, Jalen Hyatt wins the Bolitnikoff. Uh, Caleb Williams takes home the Maxwell and the Heisman. And then Sonny Dykes takes home the Coach of the Year um, any of these you want to shine a spotlight on? Um, not really. I think most all of those were kind of expected. They say. I think the only one that a lot of people are mostly up in arms about has to be um Jalen Highland. High, J- goodness gracious, Jane Hi- Jalen Hyatt. There's his, there he is, and him winning uh the Blinknikoff. Uh. A lot of people believe it should have been uh, the guy from Ohio State. Yeah, Marvin Harrison Jr. I think both receivers are really good, and I, I, I don't I don't have I, I don't have you know both their uh, statistics memorized and all their games memorized, but I think either way it went, uh, it was it would have been well deserved. Yeah, both of them deserved to win. They they were like one A and one B when it came to wide receivers this year. So I had no argument with that. Um, when it came down to uh, some of the quarterback and, and you know player of the year type awards, uh, I'm kind of surprised that Caleb Williams didn't get the sweep. Uh, normally, you know we've seen in past years where whoever wins the Heisman typically wins the Maxwell. Uh, I think like I was looking at it earlier. I think seven of the last eight Maxwell Award winners also won the Heisman. Um, the Davy O'Brien Award. I was a little bit more surprised that it was Max Duggan, but I'm I'm very happy with this year's Heisman voting. I, I think Max Duggan deserved the amount of votes he got. I, I think Caleb Williams should have won it. The only place where I had a problem with it is that Stetson or, or not Stetson. Sorry. Um, Hendon Hooker didn't make it in even as a finalist. I get that he missed the you know the last two games, but the guy was the best player in college football for eleven weeks. Yeah, I agree. I'm. I mean, don't get me wrong. Stetson Bennett's been a good quarterback at Georgia, but he he didn't deserve to go to the Heisman Final Four. I mean, he. He's been a great quarterback, and he's done great things for the University of Georgia. But I would not say he was one of the best players in the nation. I think, like you were saying with Hendon Hooker, Hendon Hooker 110% belonged to be there, and him getting injured should not have affected that. Yeah, and it, I think it, it sucks. What and, and that's exactly what happened. Is they said, oh, you're injured. And honestly, two games, the season he had and. Missing those two games, in my opinion, doesn't really make a big difference to me. Yeah, and, and like they, it, it also they did the same thing to Blake Corum. Blake Corum was easily the best running back in the in the nation outside of Bijan Robinson. But uh, the Heisman voters need to stop taking into account team success. Like, I get that, uh, like. Yes, um, C.J. Stroud played very well. His team played well. They only lost one game, and it was to Michigan. Blake Corum played all but like one and a half games this season, and his team went undefeated. So if you want to sit here and talk about how you know these guys really made a difference for their team, Blake Corum probably had the biggest impact on the team out of any of these quarterbacks outside of Max Duggan. Yeah, I agree. I think like almost the Heisman should go to whoever, <laughs> whoever. If you were to take them out of the game, the game would go completely different. Like, if, like, like just look at like Tennessee for example. When Hendon Hooker wasn't in the game for South Carolina, a team that had that had a lot of talent on there, uh, they ended up losing because yes. 
he made the biggest difference in that game. Yeah. And, and, and I think when it comes down to it, I, I think the Heisman has, has kind of lost its, I wouldn't say significance, but uh, obviously, you know, it's the, it's the biggest honor in college football. But I, I think it's lost its like competitive nature. It, it seemed like we all knew that Caleb Williams was going to win the Heisman just because he had a couple of Heisman moments over the past couple weeks. The only thing that was in his way was the, you know, what he painted on his nails, which, you know, I was hearing was, you know, something that was pushing some voters away because the Heisman voters are so high and mighty that, you know, if you put a, a cuss word on your fingernails against Utah that, you know, you're going to lose some votes, whatever. He still won by a, a pretty wide margin. But I, I think the only two awards here that, that I listed that I could easily say that person was the winner and nobody else should have won it is Will Anderson winning the Ben Eric Award. I, I don't think there was – there was obviously teams with better defenses. I don't think there was any team that had this much of a standout defensive player – as Will Anderson, and then the other is Coach of the Year. Obviously, Sonny Dykes was the Coach of the Year. Oh, one hundred and ten percent. But I, I, you know, I could have made an argument for the Davy O'Brien, the Maxwell, and the Heisman. Obviously, you can make the ar- argument for the Bolitnikoff, and you could argue that Blake Corum should have won the Doak Walker Award over Bijan. So, um, I, I will say that this year was rather competitive for the awards, but. When it came to the biggest award, I I think they missed. I think, I think in my opinion, if I was voting, I probably would. I, I know in uh, previous uh, episodes I've said Caleb Williams, but after watching f- watch watching a full game with Max Duggan, I would have voted Max Duggan. Oh, one hundred percent. Because he, especially in that conference championship game. He was the only reason that team stayed in uh, in, in the game. If you were to put any other, if you were to put their uh, another quarterback in there, that that TCU team would not be where they are without him. I think he was the single best player this year. But the issue is, uh, just to continue to complain about the Heisman, is it doesn't go to who the best player in the nation is. It goes to whoever the honestly nowadays just whoever the best offensive player is. I don't think yeah. a defensive player has finished top five in the Heisman or top even top ten in the Heisman since dang uh well, Desmond Aiden Howard. Hutchinson did last year. Oh uh, well that's still me just going on. And rant. Manti still. Teo. But still, when was when was the last time a defensive player went to New York though? Aiden Hutchinson last year. Besides him. Like Manti Teo. Okay. Uh, in twenty fifteen. And then so, before that, the last one I can even think of because I, I don't remember all of the nominees, but the last one I can think of is Charles Woodson, who's the only defensive player to win it. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I don't know why I said Desmond Howard. He was uh, I'm I think you got your Michigan guys mixed up. Yeah, but like that's only three players we can s- come up with off the top of our heads that get to go uh, that won the Heisman. And yeah. I know it, it just it's not what it's supposed to be anymore is what I'm getting at. Yeah, it, it's not. It, it's become, you know, who's the best quarterback in the nation outside of Devontae Smith winning it a couple of years ago. Like, it it kind of, you know, I don't care. I, I didn't even know that the Heisman Awards was going on until like 8 o'clock when it randomly showed up on my TV. Yeah. <laughs> like, it seemed like nobody really cared that it was going on. And, it, you know, it, it's not like there's much to talk about. Caleb Williams is playing Tulane in a couple weeks in a a bowl game. Like, they're not even playing in the playoffs. So, yeah, I I think it's lost its its, um, allure. But um, we'll move on from the award winners. Uh, I want to hit some transfer portal news before we get out of here. So, um, just a couple things to hit. Uh, Jaheim Bell, the tight end from South Carolina, uh, he entered the portal a couple, I think like a week ago. He has committed to Florida State which is huge. He is, I believe he's a Florida native. uh, And it's always nice to add another weapon. And then um, 
one of the more interesting things I saw. Um, I went on 24-7 Sports, and I was looking at their transfer portal tracker, and all I see is it says quarterback Austin Reed. It shows Western Kentucky and then an arrow to Western Kentucky. <laughs> and I was super confused. And so I went and read about it. So he announced that he was entering the transfer portal on December 5th. And then earlier today, December 13th, he notified the team that he was just going to return. He literally he told everybody that he was entering the portal and then just changed his mind in a week. But, yeah, that was just a weird one to me. Um, have you seen any other transfers that you liked? Um, not any that really co- uh, that immediately are coming to mind right now. But I do kind of want to – I like – kind of like what you said there him just transferring back to uh his own team is i think lane kiffin said this uh before this season or uh before last season why not like especially the nil net deals now and if you're a really good quarterback or athlete and whatever wherever you are why not throw your name into the transfer portal and see what you can get you know like especially yeah, he now, was sorry go ahead that well, I, just uh, just going to continue just saying, like, why not just throw your name in there and see, hey, I'm here making $50,000 a year. If I transfer to this other school, they're willing to pay me $85,000 a year to just play quarterback. Like, I, that's, that, uh, that's smart. It's free agency right now until they start regulating it, which I don't know how you're going to, is going to be like a uh, free agency. And if you can use it to your uh, benefit, use it to your benefit 100%. Yeah, and, and like I, I think that what's more interesting about this is that everybody was saying that as soon as Austin Reed announced that he was entering the portal, that he was going Power Five, and like Unnecessary Roughness like tweeted it out, and they're like, like I could see it was either Unnecessary Roughness or it was just Brandon Walker tweeted out that he's like that Austin Reed is gonna be a starter at a Power Five school next year. And then, you know, he just decides to stay and run it back. And I think that's something that we need to see more. Yeah, you can shop yourself on the market, but feel free to come back. Just because you entered the portal, you know, maybe he expressed to the team that he wanted to see what opportunities he could get. If he didn't like them, he was just going to come back. And and I think that's a good way to do it. it. It's just like in professional sports. Like you said, it's free agency. Guys like to test the market. Like Aaron Judge tested the market this offseason. Realized that the Yankees was his best option and re-signed. So I see no problem with people doing this. And I, I think it's honestly a better option than just, you know, hitting the transfer portal and burning your bridges. Yeah, I, I like that now, like, people can just be like, hey, you know what? I hit the portal because I thought I could go somewhere a little better than here, have a better opportunity to get to the league. But, you know, it. I like it. I like that. I've said this before, and I'm going to go on my transfer transfer portal rant. I like the transfer portal because it does help a lot of players get the exposure they need. My favorite example I use every single time: uh, Joe Burrows. No one would know who Joe Burrow was if he didn't transfer down to LSU. He would not be the quarterback of the Cincinnati Bengals if he doesn't transfer to to LSU. So there are good things about it. But at the same time, I, I I'm very indifferent about this whole uh almost like the nfl because i that's what i liked about college football is it was different you know you committed to play for this team and you want to do your best for this team and now it's like all right you're this is a, it, now that you're being paid it's a professional sport you can do whatever so there are good things about it and bad things about it and as the years progress under this nil and transfer portal we're going to see what they do about it, see if they regulate it at all, or if it's just going to basically turn into almost a, not a free for all, but basically a free for all. Yeah, it it's super interesting to observe the transfer portal because it, it's you know drastically different from what we saw just a couple of years ago, where you know you had to sit out a year unless your coach left, and <clears throat> excuse me, um. There is a couple of more things that I wanted to get over uh, with the transfer portal. Uh, Coastal Carolina quarterback Grayson McCall entered the transfer portal. Um, I think it's an interesting move. He'll probably end up going power five. Um, He's done some great things at Coastal. 
I, I uh, bet you he's entering because his coach just took the job at uh, Liberty, didn't he? He's a great quarterback. I would be surprised if he doesn't go Power 5. Yeah, yeah. I think he could definitely make an immediate impact on maybe um, – yeah, there's a guy that we're going to talk about later, possibly going to the school, uh, and there's a couple other guys that have been in the conversation. But I could see him going to Kentucky. Yeah, um, Kentucky's going to need a quarterback. So, yeah, uh, and, and so the other guy in the Kentucky conversation is Devin Leary from NC State. Um, he's now got interest from it looks like four teams primarily, and that's Auburn, Notre Dame. South Carolina and Kentucky, and I think all four of those spots would be a great landing spot. Um, I I don't know about Notre Dame. I don't think that's where he should go, but I think Devin Leary at Auburn would be very good. Yeah, I think. I don't know. I, I think this is a little not on the transfer portal. Uh, I'm gonna switch topics just a little bit. I find it very humorous that Auburn got rid of Gus Malzahn to three years later hire Gus Malzahn again, basically. Yeah. <laughs> they are like, very similar head coaches, and uh, I don't – I don't I, – I still don't understand the, the move to for Hugh Freeze, but, you know, it is what it is. I just that, – that just – I've been thinking about that for so long now I had to talk, say something about it because that is just so funny to me. Yeah, and then uh, the next thing that I've got here is um, South Carolina's running back Marshawn Lloyd enters the transfer portal, and I've now talked about two South Carolina players entering the transfer portal that have played very well in the past, and it kind of comes as a surprise. I thought that it looked like everybody was kind of buying in with South Carolina, and like they've had a, a, a great season. Shane Beamer is doing great things up there. But it it seems like they're kind of blowing it all up now with the transfer portal. Yeah, I think these guys, you know, they, they didn't like something there. They didn't like it. Uh, I mean, that's the beauty of the transfer portal now. If you don't like – honestly, they could, you know, like Shane Beamer, which says, say, hey, we don't like – we just don't like the program or we don't like here, whatever it is. They can just enter and go to wherever they want. I think Shane Beamer is going to have more success with recruiting players to coming to play for him. Uh, out, out of high school, I think that's kind of. I think he's more of a traditional coach in that sense. I mean, yeah, he got a uh, Spencer uh, Rattler and a couple others from the transfer portal, but I think he's really going to be focusing on getting uh, the high school uh, prospects and beating Clemson and the uh, in-state recruiting and uh, like and things like that. Because I've said it before, that's where you're going. At the end of the day, that's where you're going to win for the long term is if you can continue to get great high school recruiting classes, a lot of coaches now, yes, are focusing more on the transfer portal, but teams like Georgia, Georgia only had one person into the portal this year. And they've had the last four seasons, a top three top, honestly, top two, I'm pretty sure recruiting classes, every one of those seasons. So they're going to be okay. And they can take in a recruit uh, players in the portal if they want. But being able to win at the high school ba- uh, level is still where the parental powerhouses are going to continue to win. Yeah, I- exactly. You know, college football is a recruiting game. As much as you want to say that the transfer portal is, is changing things, and of course it is, it- it- it's still obvious that – you got to recruit, you know, you can't make an entire team out of the transfer portal. Maybe Link Giffen wants to try that, but well, it's not going to happen. If you look at Lane, if you look at his recruiting classes, he's still having top 20 recruiting classes in the nation. And he's, what he's doing is he's picking up the best prospects that still fit his uh, playbook out of the state of Mississippi and Memphis and surrounding areas like that. And uh, uh, taking in top prospects from other states, but he's only taking in a certain amount and then still hitting the portal because he, he still understands that if you have to keep in players that you mold and you bring up because that's what you need on a team to create the culture of your team. You can't just 
continue to have – you can't build a, play, a, a college program from a bunch of random players from all across the country because that's not how you win in college football. College football is all about the culture, all about what you build in college and, what, and the experiences you're going to have and what you're going to learn. That's what college football is about, and that's why – getting kids when they're young and building them up is still going to be the best way to recruit in college football. Yeah, 100%. And I I think the only thing that would take away from, you know, recruiting a guy, building him up, making him great is when maybe you're not a powerhouse school. You know, it, it's happening to all of these uh, group of five schools where these coaches do a great job of recruiting a couple guys that, you know, turn out to play very well. You know, they could have been, you know, three-star, four-stars in high school, ended up going group of five because they wanted to start. They get the reps. They work well with the coaches. They start being successful, and all of a sudden they leave. Yeah. So you're you're leaving some of these guys, or at least some of these teams, in a bad spot for your personal benefit. And I get it. You know, nobody else is going to put you in the NFL but you. But you're hurting the connections you have there. Yeah, and I just have a couple quick things to say on that is I think this is uh, one of the best – the transfer portal is one of the best things and one of the worst things to do is a group of five teams for the exact purpose you just said. A lot of these players are going to want to go to these smaller schools where, you know, they weren't – they were, you know, overlooked or whatever – and then finally, you know, they get to college and they show out uh, at these group of five schools or F- FCS schools. And then they go, oh, and now that people see them, they can go elsewhere and make more money or whatever. But at the same time, I think it's great for, like, there's a lot of players, you know, four or five-star players that don't get the playing time they, they want. Or, and then people start to forget about them. And they transfer down to, you know, a school like FAU or, you know, uh, Tulane or somewhere like that or UCF. And they get to show their uh, talent. Like, for example, John Rice Plumley, He was a uh, four-star football player. I think uh, uh, coming out of high school, I think he was a .93 something recruit. So he was almost he was on the verge of a five-star recruit. And, you know, he got replaced at Ole Miss. And that all happened. He goes down to UCF. And now he's their starting quarterback and led him to a 10-3 and three season. So I think it's a great thing for these players. And... Or, or these schools, but also, like you said, not it, it's not great for some of them. But yeah, it, and I do want to just kind of get to our last point. Um, last thing I've got is uh, FIU wide receiver Tyrese Chambers uh, has officially uh, transferred to Colorado, and I think this is just the first domino in Dion's huge changes at Colorado. I. I <laughs> I got a feeling that he's going to bring in some guys and they are going to be a team to watch out for. I I don't even think it's all that, you know, Dion is just a prolific head coach. I don't don't think that's the case. Dion has connections and Dion's got a name. People Mm -hmm. love a name. Like all of these guys want to play for Dion Sanders because he's a hall of fame corner and he's like the most like, I'm trying to think of the word, but he really exudes confidence and he is a very emotional person. And I think that really does a great thing for him when it comes to bringing guys in and them being willing to learn. Yeah, I agree with that. And people do love a name. That's why people go to schools like Alabama because they have Nick Saban. That's, you know, uh, he's a great example. They know if they go play under Nick Saban, they are going to be a great football player, and they're going to learn so much from being under Nick Saban. And it's going to be the same thing with Deion Sanders there at uh, Colorado. The one thing I kind of don't like that he did, and I didn't watch it, I just kind of read about it, is from what I've gathered from uh, reports of people saying is that he basically said, if most of you can just go ahead and hit the portal and leave, I don't want you. Uh, you know, that's uh, just kind of I, – I don't know if that's exactly what he said or, or what he said exactly, but I don't really like that because, I mean, I know you're going to create your own uh, 
you're you know you're you're trying to create your own culture and create your own team. But I I just don't I I and it's nice to be honest, but I just kind of don't like how he was that brutally honest to these players and these boys because. For any of them that stay, that's going to leave, or wherever they go, that's going to leave a bad taste in their mouth. Well, what I can say, and, and to argue for Dion in that case, is we talk about all the time where a head coach gets to a place, uh, or like gets to a new job, and we always talk about, well, these aren't their guys. And I think Dion's just trying to avoid that. Obviously, he's going to keep the guys that, you know, want to stay and want to play for Deion Sanders and truly think that they have a spot. But when it comes down to it, Deion Sanders wants to win football games. And with what we saw from the players on Colorado this season, they don't win football games. So Deion marching in there and telling you that to hit the portal it should be motivation to you to go somewhere, spend the time with a coach, and just get better. Because this Colorado team was horrible last year. Yeah, I agree. I just, I, you know, I just, uh, I'm a little, I guess I'm a little nicer. And I, I just always hate when things like that happen. And I, I agree. I hope that is motivation for a lot of these players because Colorado did look horrid. And I'm not going to blame it just on the players. Obviously, there was some poor coaching there. But some, I, I do hope all those players get their time to shine wherever they end up being. I, I think that'll do it for us. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about, Brock? Not that I can think of. I think we hit about all the points I wanted to say today. All right. Well, once again, thank you to Brooks for sponsoring this episode. Make sure you check out brooksrunning.com or your local sporting goods store to get geared up for these holidays and uh, get ready for those New Year's resolutions. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think that's going to do it. We will catch y'all on Friday, uh, our first ever Friday episode, a, a newcomer to the show. And, and I think you guys will really enjoy it. So we will catch y'all on the Friday episode. See ya.